One of their best shows, and probably their best sitcom, was Lab Rats. Hey, it's Fred! They released really odd videos, so let's rank all of them. Hello, this is the Cartoon Koala. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Uh, princess? Where are Max and Ruby's parents? Today! It's a solar eclipse day. Join me as I revisit the Despicable Me trilogy. For 68. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Hello, this is the Cartoon Koala. One. Hi, I'm the Cartoon Koala. Okay, this is great. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Hello, Doc. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Do it, your mom. Do it, do it, your mom. PBS Kids Sprout. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Garfield the Cat. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala. Hi, this is the Cartoon Koala, and if you're watching this, then that means we finally did it. After four years, technically double that, but that's a story for another day. Finally, I hit 1,000 subscribers through good times and bad times. Many, many bad times. Unexpected hits, expected hits, unexpected bombs. My YouTube poop phase, my reviewer phase, my wiggles phase, my re-upload phase, my SML phase. We still managed to pull through. Of course, this is the part where I say all the generic sentiments that YouTubers always say when they hit a milestone. Thank you to anyone who has watched, commented, or liked any of my videos, or I never imagined that I would get this big, or to know that there's this many people that want to listen to what I have to say, blah, blah, blah. It would all come across as disingenuous, even if it did come from a place of sincerity. Well, it would be wrong to say that I never imagined this would ever happen. I have many times but there were times where i doubted i would ever be able to get there where views were oh so low and growth oh so slow and that milestone seemed oh so very far away but finally we're here and i couldn't be happier and hey there's more than one reason to celebrate as by sheer coincidence this is also my 50th video technically i've made much more than that but again that's a story for another day wait there's one more mom this is my 50th currently publicly available video and i'm sure a lot of you are probably wondering what i'm gonna do to celebrate such a momentous occasion well when i hit 500 subscribers i did something that nobody really seemed to want and nobody really seemed to watch all just because of a throwaway joke in a video that it seemed like nobody had really watched 500 subscribers and i'll watch cars too maybe but this time i'm doing the review that all of this has secretly been building up to and to most of you, I imagine this just seems like a regularly scheduled review video. Nothing special. But trust me, I've been intentionally foreshadowing this throughout my whole career. Anyone who's been with me for a long time would know that one of my favorite shows to reference is the obscure Disney XD original series, Crash and Bernstein. My channel trailer to this day is still my ripoff of the Cory in the House anime OP, but with Crash and Bernstein. A video that can't be viewed in Russia because it uses the Evangelion theme. As much as I still like it, I should seriously consider changing that soon. Hmm. Crash and Bernstein, of course, had a spot in my dumb Pooh's Adventures intro that some people mistook as serious and got some people really pissed for some reason. There's an extended reference to Crash and Bernstein in my Horrid Henry review. Crash and Bernstein. This is one of my most favorite TV shows ever. I watch it every week, and nothing can stop me when I'm king. I'll force stuck up Steve. I am not stuck up, I'm boss. To watch every single episode of Crash and Bernstein. Three billion times! No! Its theme song can be heard in my Charlie Brown YTP. <laughs> Hello? 
I reference the show twice in my Lab Rats retrospective. Or in the case of Crash and Bernstein, they just went all in on the boys rule mentality. Don't worry, I still love you. But I felt like I had to mention her just because she's played by Oana Gregory, who played Amanda on Crash and Bernstein. What's up with all these anime actors? Crash can be briefly spotted in my Brian Hole YouTube poop. I mentioned Crash in my Disney Junior tier list video. There's Basil, he's the smart one, and he's voiced by someone very important. Then there's actually quite the long hiatus in terms of individual references until my It's All Connected video that nobody watched. And next after that, I finally was able to make the April Fool's video of my dreams centered around it. Do it your mom! Do it, do it your mom! Crash is in my channel banner. He appears at the end of most of my scripted videos. He's a major character on my joke wiki that hasn't been significantly altered in ages, but I still link on my YouTube page. In my memes of him, I advocate that people create more memes of him, which I still do advocate that. This show definitely still has a a ton of untapped meme potential. He's practically the unofficial mascot of my channel, and yeah, I've wanted to review this show for a long time. I even mentioned it in some of my really crappy old videos, and did review it in a really crappy old robot voice video that should never see the light of day. Whoa, that's weird. I didn't remember her being this big. Along with two other shows that along with Crash and Bernstein, I now realize they probably deserve full length reviews. And I can't believe I still haven't gotten around to them yet. But with Crash and Bernstein, I at least have the excuse that I was saving it up for the 1000 subscriber special. I've been planning this as the 1000 subscriber special for the longest time now. I don't care if nobody else cares or watches it because I care. This is the video I want to make, and I am so glad that I finally have the chance to give this show the full length retrospective that it deserves. It probably won't even be the longest or biggest video on my channel, probably not even close, there's only two seasons and 39 episodes. It wasn't even that popular in its original run. It definitely won't be the most viewed. Like I said, it's probably gonna feel like just another review to most people. But again, I don't care. This review needs to happen. I want Crash and Bernstein to be a major part of my online persona. I want to spread more awareness to this awesomely stupid or stupidly awesome show. And by God, I want people to show their appreciation by making more memes of it. The wiki for this show used to be a total meme, and then someone went in and fixed it. And that makes me really sad. Hashtag more Crash and Bernstein memes. As negative as I can be in some videos, my favorite part of this will always be shining a light on underappreciated media. Not the media that has completely aged like milk. Obviously Crash and Bernstein doesn't hold up perfectly, but there's a lot more there than I think most people realize. It's complicated. I'm getting ahead of myself. But if I can show people that, even slightly, for Crash and Bernstein, then everything, my whole YouTube career, will have been worth it. While you may not realize it, I feel like this is the culmination of my entire career so far. It's a show that I went from loving as a 7 year old, to hating as a 5th grader, to ironically loving, and eventually unironically loving again in middle school. Me and this show go back. And hey, this was the first show I talked about in that crappy old video. So maybe we can tackle those other two shows next in that same order. Who knows? Without further ado, let's get into why I love Crash and Bernstein. I don't think I need to introduce Disney XD to you guys again. I think I've sufficiently introduced it in previous videos. In short, the Disney Channel was becoming more and more female oriented, which made us seven year old boys in the audience feel alienated. So Disney decided to fuse its sister channel to Disney, formerly completely dedicated to reruns of their animated shows, and that channel's action oriented block, Jet which had already been taken up more and more airtime, and created Disney XD. The name purportedly means nothing, but it meant so much to us seven-year-old boys in the audience. At one point, I considered it my favorite channel. Though that's probably only because it showed a lot more cartoons than Nick and Disney, and I wasn't allowed to watch much Cartoon Network. But while it did have a big focus on animation, becoming basically the sole home for Disney's TV animation at a brief point, 
it did still produce many live action sitcoms from the same studio as the Disney Channel sitcoms, and usually in that same traditional sitcom format. But most of them were a lot higher concept, and in my opinion, generally of a higher quality than those on the main channel, with them usually throwing in skateboards and action and sci-fi and rock and roll to appeal more towards boys, because no girl has ever liked any of those things. Same with its early animated shows, before Disney just decided to start dumping all of its animated shows on the network, not counting preschool. Crash and Bernstein decided to take a different approach by having it embody that boys rule mentality very directly, which is probably part of the reason why Crash was sort of the unofficial mascot for the channel for the brief time his show was on the air. That and he was an easily recognizable puppet character and it was fun to see him interact with their other live action stars. And definitely more easy to integrate him than it would have been with their traditionally and CG animated characters. Though even as a kid I thought this guy looked like the evil twin of Walter from the 2011 Muppets movie and thought for sure he was just a recolor, and I don't think I'm alone on this. Crash and Burn Scene was created by Eric Friedman, most notably a former writer on Nickelodeon shows like Zoe 101 and Drake and Josh. And looking at his written by credits on the latter show, he had a pretty good track record. If you're wondering how he landed a job creating a Disney show, he had also written a couple episodes of shows like I'm in the Band and Austin and Alley. Yeah, if you look at the writer's rooms of any show from It's a Laugh Productions, there's usually at least a little bit of overlap, which partially explains why most of their shows feel very samey. The show was first announced in April 2012, officially started in production in May, though this article also refers to Bernstein as being 14 instead of 12 as he's depicted in the show, and would premiere its first episode on Disney XD later that year on October 8th at 8.30pm during Disney XD's signature Monday night premiere block, then called Monday Mayhem. It was off to a good start being sandwiched between new episodes of two of Disney XD's flagship shows, Kicking It and Lab Rats. They even gave it one of those little doomsday counters in the bottom right corner. They were hyping the heck out of it. The pilot episode is cleverly titled Crash Lands. Did you realize this show's title is a pun on the phrase crash and burn? And if you're wondering, yes, every title involves the word crash somehow. At least in the first season. I guess in the second season they gave up. The quality of these buns highly varied, so it was probably probably for the best they did that. Now the pilot is fundamental and fully understanding the premise of the show, so I will first recap it before discussing the show overall. But before we even get into the pilot, we have to briefly discuss the show's iconic theme song. I think it was some sort of mandate at Disney XD that all of their shows had to have rap themes. And in all of these instances, it comes across as a desperate attempt to seem cool and hip to the young male audience. In fact, there are very few instances of rap theme songs in general that don't come across as desperate and corporate pandering, and Crash and Bernstein is no exception. It's like they decided to channel of the show's elementary schooler-esque sexism into one song. You have some exceptionally stupid lyrics, them listing off things that girls like versus what boys like. No makeup or feelings, be party or dog. Now it's ninjas and football and baseball. Ironic since Crash himself is canonically a doll. And a very repetitive chorus. Crash and burn! Sting. Crash and burn! Sting. Crash and burn! Sting. What he said! And I used to hate this song. I thought it was extremely annoying. And to anyone else, it probably would still be. And I should hate it since it gives a bad first impression to anyone who's unfamiliar with the show. The actual show isn't this obnoxious or this pandering or this sort of sexist. For for the most part. But I've heard it so many times at this point that I've become numb to it, and I've come to accept that this is the theme song to Crash and Bernstein and I wouldn't want it any other way. I probably know the lyrics by heart, don't get me started. Let me tell you about 
constant. The show was composed by Jamie Dunlap, who did the music for several other Disney XD sitcoms, but also Clone High and South Park. And I salute you for providing us with this wonderfully awful theme song, as well as the end credits rendition and the many renditions that play during scene changes. And come to think of it, the show in general has quite a few musical sequences and they're usually highlights. So yeah, Jamie Dunlap, I salute you for providing the wonderful music to this wonderful show. On to the first episode. The pilot introduces us to Wyatt Bernstein, a young boy who lives in an apartment building in Portland, Oregon, with his mother Mel and his three sisters, Amanda, Cleo, and Jasmine. On his 12th birthday, his sisters blindfold him with a bra and surprise him by taking him to build a bestie an even girlier version of Build-A-Bear. Instead of building teddy bears, you build regular dolls. From the exterior shot, you can tell this is obviously not a Build-A-Bestie or any establishment of the sort, with the sign clearly being plastered over it in post. I'm not smart enough, nor do I care enough to try and track down the actual location. Mrs. B seems surprised and scolds Amanda for choosing such a girly place, even though it's implied this has happened multiple times before. Amanda! When I asked you to plan this, I assumed that you'd pick a place Wyatt would like. The places you take me are always so girly. Bernstein, in a fit of rage, creates his ideal bestie or brother, naming him Crash. When they bring Crash home, he rather inexplicably comes to life. Bernstein himself is immediately accepting, and the question of how this happened gets dropped rather quickly. I don't get it. How'd you come to life? I don't know. How did any of you come to life? The world is full of miracles. No one else in the series ever seems to question it at all. Seriously, they see this doll walking and talking on its own and don't ask any questions. It's shown that the other dolls from Build a Bestie don't come to life, so clearly Crash is an exception, but we see people who work at the Build a Bestie unfazed by him being alive. But obviously, it's not something you're really supposed to question, and I feel like any explanation they could have come up with would have been even more stupid than having him be alive completely inexplicably. It was kind of a magical moment when uh, he was, you know, when Wyatt was forced to make a doll for his birthday, and while he was making me, he kind of wished for me, so I came to life, and now I'm there stuck with me. Immediately, Crash starts wreaking havoc, much to Bernstein's excitement and everyone else's frustration. Crash, do not eat Ferret Bueller! We never see Ferret Bueller again, so I can only assume that Crash ate him off screen. These women are constantly threatening to kill Crash, not just in this episode, but throughout the whole show. Take him to the garbage chute. Make it look like an accident. But if you cross me, so help me, I will hollow you out and use you as a very ugly purse. Did Wyatt ever tell you about his favorite robot? Hmm. Funny story. It annoyed me, and somehow it ended up in the incinerator. So, what's your point? Check your tag. You're flammable. He's packaged with a real working sword. Yes, Build-A-Bestie has the option of giving your doll a real working weapon. Crash, we don't have swords in this apartment. Oh, that's okay. I brought enough for everybody. <laughs> Crash and Bernstein have a brief falling out, though, when in an attempt to give Bernstein his own room, since he currently has to share with Cleo, Crash saws off an entire wall, revealing a loser, as Crash calls him, who Mrs. B refers to as Toby. I swear I've seen this guy as an extra in other stuff like Spider-Man or something, but because he has no lines, he goes uncredited, unlike this Build-A-Bestie in Employee, who is also a one-off but gets a credit because he has actual dialogue. Though for some reason he's simply credited as build a bestie employee. Even though he is given a name, just not verbally, his name tag says Eric. In fact, pretty much every one-off character is simply credited with a descriptor instead of a name, even when they are named in the episode. Crash and Bernstein ultimately reconcile at the iconic arcade, the show's main hangout. And we find out that Crash has already gotten himself a fake ID in just three days of being alive. 
You've only been alive for three days. Shh. My fake ID says I'm a week and a half. Which I think brings his number of crimes so far up to three. And this is just the first episode. A scene earlier where Crash makes a sign with perfect spelling gets contradicted when Crash says he can't spell. Do I have to spell it out for you? Yes. Alright. Alright, I can't spell. And Crash is able to avoid getting evicted by the landlord by helping him demolish the build a bestie where all this started. Keep this in mind. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. We can't destroy this place. It holds so many memories. You built me here. Actually, that's my only memory. Let's tear this second down! And yes, in the background, you can see some of the same brand puppets SML uses. I can never escape it. The episode ends with Crash getting brain damage, even though he shouldn't have a brain. Is my name Crash? No, seriously, what's my name? <laughs> I wasn't wearing a hard hat. As a pilot, you can tell they have to spend a lot of time establishing the premise, which means that the whole boys versus girls mentality is a lot more prominent here than it is in most of the show, which can get irritating. But there is still the show's usual brand of comedy, which I happen to find quite funny. Even when a lot of the dialogue and jokes are quite flatly written, I think most of the actors are able to deliver them in a way that makes them actually funny. That and the fact that it's a puppet. I mean, it has the iconic eggplant joke. How could I resist? I don't have time to deal with an annoying purple thing. It's golden I've introduced you to the plot and world of Crash and Bernstein, I think it's about time I introduce you to the characters of Crash and Bernstein, describing to you every recurrent character, as in appears at least twice, from most frequently appearing to least frequently appearing. Firstly, there are the show's five main characters, as listed in the theme song. The titular characters, Crash and Wyatt Bernstein, appear in every single episode. All 38 or 39 of them. Depends on how you count them. First, of course, there's Crash, who is played by Tim Legasse, who is one of those puppeteers who's had a hand in, no pun intended, pretty much every puppet-based production in the 90s and 2000s. And I love him. I don't think Crash's character would be nearly as funny as it is with a less likable performer at the helm. He truly carries the show and does a wonderful job working off his human co-stars. Crash was designed by Bernstein to be the ideal brother, on paper a not so glamorous stereotype of masculinity. Spitting, grunting, destructive, violent, and highly opinionated, yet athletic, crafty, and ultimately loyal. Despite this, he is consistently portrayed as cowardly and weak, two things that even conflict with this warped vision of manhood. Once brought to life though, Crash proves himself to be a being of pure chaos and unpredictability. Quite similar to the cat in the hat as depicted in the 2003 film, he lives entirely by the rule of fun, with no regard for the safety, feelings, or well-being of those around him, consistently ruining things for Bernstein and his family. While he may come off as an idiot, secretly he is a mastermind and the smartest character on the show. Because also much like the cat in the hat, Crash is shown to be the only character in the show who is aware that he is fictional. Don't believe me? In season 2 episode 8, Merry Crash and Fest, at the very end, Crash wishes us, the audience, a Merry Crash and Fest, and then face slams the screen, remarking, Ah, your TV is hard. This proves that Crash knows full well that he's in a TV show, something that no other character even alludes to. And thus, all of the chaos he creates, he does not just do for his own amusement, but for the entertainment of the viewer. Which is why even in his destructive wake, he always ensures that there's a happy ending. 
both so he doesn't come across too unlikable, which would turn us away, and to also ensure that the show goes on, with everything being back to normal just in time for the next episode in typical sitcom fashion. Every little thing that happens in the show, all probably orchestrated by Crash for our entertainment. He's equivalent to God in their universe. This alone makes him one of the most powerful and intelligent characters in all of fiction. It also explains his completely inconsistent intelligence, physical strength, and general physiology. And all the random powers he forms seemingly on the fly. It's all completely dependent on what will make us laugh. Also, he's really funny. Throughout the show, he dons many alternate persona. In fact, over half the episodes have him don at least one alternate identity. Some have him don many. These alternate identities include Coach, Sovereign Millionaire, Bernstein's Grandpa, Rapper, Cheerleader, Nurse, Samba, Salesman, Chef, Caveman, Sovereign Millionaire, Cat, Gladiator, Lawyer, Crashy McSmarty Pants, Boy Band Members, Mime, Sovereign Millionaire, Falcon, Sovereign Millionaire, Ghost Hunter, Mrs. Pesto's Mother, Mr. Pesto's father. This is the closest we get to seeing Pesto's parents in the flesh. Construction worker. Dalmatian. Sportscaster. Dance instructor. Crudsworth the Crash and Fest Beaver. Sovereign Millionaire. Gladiator again. Caveman again. Chef again. Great Aunt Biddy. Crash Mind Freak. Dog. Duck Dynasty. No, seriously. Grease Monkey. British customer, old lady customer, cat customer, archer, sovereign millionaire. I guess they really liked Tim Legasse's sovereign millionaire impression. Flight attendant and a space captain. Apparently the network was also afraid that kids would imitate Crash's actions, so before episodes they'd show this safety warning. Face slam! Wait, hold on! I am made of cloth and stuffing. All the wild and crazy awesome things I do on the show cannot hurt me or anyone else. You, however, are not made of cloth and stuffing. So keep it real and leave all the mayhem and face slamming to me. Rock on! Next, there's the show's other title character, Wyatt Bernstein or simply Bernstein, as Crash refers to him. So that's also how I'll refer to him. Since Crash is our almighty overlord. Played by Cole Jensen, he is a bit of a blank slate. Besides just being into all this stereotypical guy stuff that Crash and presumably the young boys in the audience are also into. And showing that living as a guy with so many girls is so hard, am I right boys? Amongst the rest of the main cast, he typically acts as the straight man, being one of the more down-to-earth and reasonable characters on the show. Reacting to Crash's zany antics and occasionally those of others, which is a part that Cole Jensen plays rather well. He is usually at his best at his most sarcastic. Cole Jensen delivers these snarky lines beautifully. Uh oh, this could be bad for you. What? Do both your feet point forward. Oh, <gasps> yes! Do you have ears on both sides of your head? <laughs> I do! Are you worried that everything around you could make you sick? Worried sick! Well, I hate to tell you, but I'm afraid you have an incurable case of absolutely nothing! And his acting is honestly quite impressive. Not just when you consider that this is a Disney show and their standards are usually pretty low, but if this birth date is to be believed, he wouldn't have even been 11 when the show started production making him a bit younger than his already young character. And obviously, child actors do not usually have the best reputation. Moving past the title characters and onto the characters who are still frequent enough to get a spot in the theme song, first there's Cleo, played by Landry Bender, Bernstein's sister of indeterminate age. Most official descriptions of the show simply list her as the middle sister of the family, which 
No, duh. It's only the Apple TV description that explicitly refers to her as being older than Bernstein. Wikipedia agrees, describing her as being 13, and indeed, in real life, Landry Bender was just a year older than Cole Jensen, which would still make her a bit younger than her character. But as I mentioned earlier, there are also some sources that falsely describe Bernstein as being 14, when he is very explicitly shown to be in the 7th grade throughout season 1, and thus in the 8th grade by the start of season 2. So this is clearly not always an indicator. Plus, if she was already in 8th grade at the start of the show, then by the end of it, wouldn't she have moved on to high school instead of still being shown attending the same school as Bernstein? Unless she got held back or something. And in season 2, episode 4, Trash and Bernstein, Cleo is explicitly referred to as Bernstein's the younger sister multiple times. If I win, big deal, I beat my little sister. But if I lose, that's a big deal. I got beat by my little sister. How does it feel to get beat by your little sister? All of the birth dates for characters listed on the Crash and Bernstein fan wiki are completely bogus. So I'm gonna place her at 11 years old at the start, which makes her younger than Bernstein, but would make it still make sense for her to be attending the same school as him for the duration of the show. The wiki also claims that she owns 78 hats, did someone seriously go through each episode of the show and count every individual hat she wears? Cause she wears a lot of hats. If this number is to be believed, then she wears roughly two hats per episode. Not even I was crazy enough to think to do that. And I've spent a whole minute determining the age of the same character that nobody cares about from a show that nobody else besides me cares about. And I'm now realizing that this isn't actually an exact count of the number of hats she wears across the show's episodes, but a reference to a throwaway joke in Monster Crash. Crash, I own 78 hats. Why would I need yours? Cleo is the third most commonly recurring character, appearing in 35 of the 38 episodes, only being absent for three episodes in a row in season two. As you'll continue to see, the show did a much worse job spreading out its character appearances in the second season. Primarily, she's a businesswoman, promoting her company that she acts as the CEO of, Cleo. Or, I'm sorry, Cleo. Adding At least for guess, the first and season. And having a new business venture in most episodes she appears in. The show seems to think her defining character trait is her sarcasm, but honestly, I would attribute that much more to Bernstein, as she's usually more actively insulting and hot-headed. For me, the two words that come to mind when describing her would be cunning and manipulative, as she is shown to always know how to sell a product and or get what she wants from other people. Next is Amanda, played by Awana Gregory, who is Bernstein's oldest sister at the age of 16. She appears in 30 of the show's 38 episodes, being absent for only 5 episodes in season 1, and then 3 in a row in season 2, which also just happened to be those same 3 episodes Cleo was absent for. She's very much her stereotypical blonde teenage girl. Crash himself said it best in the episode Monster Crash when he says, She loves fashion almost as much as she loves herself. And Bernstein notably could not come up with one genuine redeeming trait of hers in the episode Party Crasher. You have some really great qualities. Yeah? Oh, I have to name them? <laughs> okay, um, you're tall. She is many things. Shallow, superficial, vain, selfish, cold, and uncaring. Her obsessions include her phone, boys, fashion, and popularity. The latter of which so much so that in Educating Crash, she could not stand the idea of her 12-year-old brother being more popular than her. If you made my little brother more popular than me, I swear I will turn you into a toilet seat cover. She is also often shown to be quite airheaded, again, blonde stereotype. Though surprisingly, she is also shown to have an interest in math. I like math. You mean with the numbers? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun. Even tutoring girls who are dumber than her. I can't. I'm helping Crystal with her math. And she's not very bright. <laughs> oh, no, 
brought you a different crystal. Finally, rounding out the main cast, we have Pesto, played by Aaron Landon, who appears in 28 of the show's 38 episodes, being absent for 7 episodes in season 1, and once again, 3 episodes in a row in season 2, albeit not all the same ones. Generally, he's absent from episodes that primarily focus on the family, since he's surprisingly not shown to live in their apartment building. He was Bernstein's normal human best friend before Crash came into his life, which at first causes a bit of a rivalry between him and Crash, or a friendship triangle between him, Crash, and Bernstein, with him and Crash starting out heating each other's guts before becoming really good friends in Episode 7, Motorcycle Crash, leaving Bernstein alone and jealous, only for them to all learn to be friends by the end, and yet Crash still treats him like trash after this. Theoretically, Pesto is a great addition, as he gives Bernstein someone he can confide in who isn't completely mentally unstable, and would help ground both the show and the character of Bernstein in reality, but in practice he functions less as Bernstein's normal human friend who he can talk to, and more as the show's designated butt monkey. It's rare to see him come on screen without some misfortune befalling him, or a joke at his expense. He's a total awkward mess. He's gullible, unself-aware, cowardly, his girly scream never ceases to make me laugh. He is horrible under pressure, which makes him practically incapable of lying even when it's the cover for his friends, and he couldn't take a hint to save his life. It's very likely that his current personality is a result of his upbringing and home life. As well, we never see any of his relatives in person, we can pick up a few things from what he says about them. Like that he has his own brothers, who he doesn't seem to have the best relationship with. My brothers are jerks! Pesto, I need your bike, it's an emergency! Thanks for asking! Usually my brothers just knock me off and take it. And an overprotective mother. Mom said I couldn't get in a canoe without a life jacket. An overprotective mother, who he at several points seems to have a relationship with that is too close for comfort, shall I say? Oh, conversation starters. I got one of those for the ladies. Hey, gorgeous. How about making me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? I've only used it on my mom, but it works. It's not you. It's me. What does that mean? My mom tells me that all the time. Let me be your rock. <laughs> or you could be my rock. I'm comfortable with a strong woman. Just ask my mother. Had the show gone on longer, would we have maybe actually seen some of his family in person? Who knows? But if there's one thing you remember from his character, it's probably his obsessive crush on Amanda. Almost all of his subplots revolve around his attempts to woo her, which always fail miserably, even if she has no problem taking advantage of it to get stuff out of him. You two wouldn't be planning some kind of revenge prank, would you? Nope. <laughs> really, Pestine? which is totally not creepy at all. In Undercover Crash, a kind of sort of love triangle forms between Cleo, Pesto, and Amanda when we find out that Cleo has a genuine crush on him, though she at one point says she wants him as a trophy husband. I'm gonna be very successful when I meet a trophy husband. It personifies itself through flattery that seems to go completely over Pesto's head. Amanda tells her to back off since she sees Cleo as competition. Again, totally not creepy at all. And the subplot ultimately ends with Cleo unceremoniously dumping Pesto, and her feelings for him are never brought up again in the whole show. Making this pointless even by the usual standards of subplots on this show. The whole shtick of the young nerdy boy trying to woo the girl who is way out of his league is a fairly common one, especially in these types of shows, and it's one that I'm never too fond of as it's rarely ever funny and he usually just comes across as kind of sad and pathetic, and this is not an exception. In fact, in general, I am not a huge fan of the show's main three side characters, as they're all kind of one note and prove to be obnoxious in their own ways, and since they're usually the focus of the show's subplots, those tend to be quite repetitive and generally forgettable. I think Crash and Bernstein is a rare example of a half-hour comedy show where not once does a sub 
subplot overshadowed the main plot in terms of comedy and entertainment value. Though I do not blame the actors as they all do their best with the material they're given and play off the other cast members well, even managing to bring out some laughs from the show's more lackluster material. If you recognize any of these actors, it's probably because most of them also had small roles on other Nick and Disney shows. Cole Jensen was in an episode of Victorious where, funnily enough, he ditches his puppet for a woman. Oana Gregory had minor recurring roles in both Kicking It and Lab Rats beforehand, and also has an OnlyFans now. No, I'm not joking. Hey guys, it's Wana Gregory. I finally joined OnlyFans. I'm so excited. Well, I think we know who's going to be first to sign up for that, am I right? Ha <laughs> ha. The most successful of them after the show is probably Landry Bender. And even that's not saying much when her most notable roles are co star in a similarly short lived Disney sitcom, Best Friends When Ever, and a recurrent character on Fuller House. It's kind of a shame since, like I said, they're all pretty good at what they do, but it is usually the curse of being a sitcom actor, I guess. You usually only become known for playing that one character in that one show. Moving on to supporting characters. The show didn't have a ton of time to build a huge supporting cast, so as we go down the list, you'll start to notice a lot of characters whose appearances are in the single digits. Like I said, I'm counting any character who appeared more than once as recurring. First, there's Mel Bernstein, or Mrs. B as Crash calls her. So once again, that's what I'll exclusively be referring to her as from now on. Played by Mary Birdsong, beforehand a regular cast member on the Comedy Central series Reno. 911, which I'm not gonna pretend to have seen. She appears in 17 of the 25 episodes in season 1, with just her voice being heard in one, which technically makes 18 the same number as Pesto, yet she still wasn't considered a main character, though I guess she would have felt pretty out of place dancing with the rest of the cast in the intro. And then she appears in only 4 of the 13 episodes in season 2, 3 of them in a row, which all just so happen to be the same episodes Pesto is actually absent from. Something else you'll notice is that in general, the supporting characters became much less prominent in season 2. She is little more than a concerned mother, constantly frustrated with Crash and scolding and disciplining her kids, occasionally being there to give some motherly advice, which usually goes ignored. Though once again, her actress plays that part pretty well, all things considered. Next, there's Jasmine, Bernstein's youngest sister at age 6 played by McKenna Grace, who has actually gone on to have a pretty successful career since Crash and Bernstein. This was actually her acting debut. What a place to start. She appears in 12 of the 25 episodes in season 1, about half, and then only three times in season 2, two of them in a row. Again, weird overlap, with those also being two of the only episodes Mrs. B is present for and Pesto is absent for. Bernstein at one point refers to her as his least annoying sister. Just but honestly, she can't be that far behind the other two. She's one of those contradictory little girl characters. She looks cute and innocent on the outside and is into all sorts of girly things, but has a loud mouth and is more intelligent than she lets on, being surprisingly good with technology. And she can be quite manipulative to make sure things go her way, something she probably picked up from her older sisters. She's also shown to be a bit of a spoiled brat and sometimes takes pleasure in her family's suffering. There's Mr. Poulos, played by Danny Woodburn, who's had minor roles in a number of well-known shows and movies, including doing the mocap for Splinter in the first live-action Ninja Turtles movie, apparently. And the Airbud Corporation seems to have a soft spot for him. He's the landlord of the Bernstein's apartment building. Or at least at first he is, having the authority to evict Crash for making the hole in the wall. But as the series progresses, there's more emphasis on him being a plumber and maintenance man who just so happens to always be hanging out with these kids for some reason. He's my favorite side character by far and favorite character in general. Besides Crash, of course. He's a short man with a short fuse, always carrying his swear jar, which he yells muffled obscenities into. <laughs> The 
though there might be more to him than meets the eye, as his diary reveals him to actually be a deeply depressed and lonely man with aspirations far beyond plumbing. I feel like a man whose hopes have been destroyed, who dances beautifully, but always alone. What did you just say? Sorry, Mr. Poulos, but Crash just ate your diary. <laughs> You will get to Paris someday! I just know it! Danny Woodburn plays his part beautifully. When he and Crash are together, it makes for comedy gold, both when they're at each other's throats and even the rare times they actually get along. And even he and Pesto make for a fun dynamic, even if it's shown much more rarely. He appears ten times in season one, yet it honestly feels like more than that, which I think is due to the fact that they did a really good job spreading them out so you still feel satisfied. Unlike season two, where he appears just twice in a row, again, two of the episodes the two main sisters are absent. For. If I had to speculate the reason for his decreased presence, in the first season he partially acted as a father-like figure to the kids when their real fathers were absent often taking them under his wing and showing them his manly ways. Although but then something happened in season 2 that gasp. made that part of his character kind of redundant. And it's not like we had any short of characters to yell at Crash. Still, he was always a treat to see, and the show would not be as good without him. After that is when I kind of have to start stretching it in terms of what should be considered a supporting character. Each character from here on out appears in only 5 episodes or last. First there's Roland, the newspaper vendor on the street outside Crash and Bernstein's apartment who's shown to be a friend of Mr. Poulos. They never gave him a very well-defined personality, he's just kind of another person there to react to Crash's crazy antics, with the street and his newspaper stand mostly acting as a backdrop for his said antics. But Ron Funches plays him so well, practically every line he says is hilarious, and I attribute that mostly to his over-the-top delivery. Would it kill you people to buy a magazine? Or a scone? Just a scone? This is my business! Which is why, even though I understand why, since again, he didn't have as much of a unique role in the cast, I'm kind of upset he didn't return for season 2. After appearing in 5 episodes towards the end of season 1, all rather close together. Coach Urquhart, played by Chip Chinnery, who has also mostly had bit roles and is apparently a financial advisor and little known stand-up comedian. He's the only minor character who actually appeared more in season 2 than 1 appearing twice in season 1 and then three times in season 2, the once again all three in a row. What's up with that? Actually, it's probably just specific characters, ideas, or locations being on the writer's minds when writing several episodes in a row. He's basically an all-purpose coach, wrestling coach, science teacher, cup stacking ref, so on and so forth. It's revealed in Crashlemania, though, that he and Mr. Poulos were former wrestling partners, the Plunger and the Cyclone. But they had a fallen out when Coach stole Mr. Poulos' signature move, though they seem to have reconciled since. He's a bit offbeat, but not in an especially memorable way. Scotty, played by Curtis Harris, is another old friend of Bernstein's, which seems like it would make him redundant to Pesto, but in terms of personality and status, he is pretty much opposite, being a confident charmer loved by all. Head in six different school clubs as well as the school news. With this in mind, it would have been very easy to make him a jerk, but no, he's actually a pretty nice guy, even when competing with Bernstein. Curtis Harris has some good charisma, but his character doesn't have a ton of comedic or plot potential so I can see why he was rarely used, only appearing in four episodes in season one and then once again completely disappearing in season two. But unlike other characters, I think there might have been a bit more to this than just the writers forgetting about him, which is that by the time Crash and Bernstein was picked up for a second season, Nickelodeon had already started production on The Haunted Halfaways, which had Curtis Harris in a major role. And I doubt either network wanted their actors working for both of them at the same time. Mr. Bernstein, Carl, is mentioned only once in season one. It, uh, seems like 
like you're forgetting someone. Someone very important. Came into your life and changed it forever. Oh, I know who you're talking about. My dad is Dr. Feinblum. Before appearing three times in season two. Again, all in a row. Where we find out that he's a wildlife photographer, and his absence was merely a result of him constantly traveling. Him and Crash have a fierce rivalry when he first returns, albeit mostly one-sided, but they end up warming up to each other, and Carl is generally one of the more patient characters when it comes to dealing with Crash's antics. In terms of the parental dynamic, if Mrs. B is the bad cop, then Carl is the good cop. His job is also used to make a couple throwaway jokes about how foreign cultures are so weird, am I right? You can play pro ball for the Boruago Pygmy League. But don't. They play to the death. In Mongolia, they feast on warm yak yogurt. The last one to yak gets to keep the yak. He isn't too terribly interesting as a character, but it's another case where his actor, Richard Ricolo, is able to get some funny material out of him. He was formerly a lead in the sitcom Two Guys and a Girl, which, I'm gonna be honest, I never even heard of beforehand, but apparently he co-starred alongside Ryan Reynolds, so that counts for something, I guess. Gretchen Florger, played by Katia Lidsky, definitely feels like she was supposed to be just a one-off. Her similar son, Jerry, was only in the episode she first appears in, but nonetheless, she returns in two more episodes throughout the series. She's introduced as an annoying neighbor, then reappears in Crashy McSmarty Pants as one of Crash's blind followers, and then last appears in season two as the antagonist of the episode, Helfoween. The one thing consistent about her is that she is the embodiment of a Karen. Rufus Reed, aka The Slapper, played by Zachary Conning, is the closest thing this show has to a recurring antagonist. And even then, he only appears in two episodes, both season one. He's your typical school bully, using brute strength to intimidate the other kids into getting whatever he wants from them, nicknamed the Slapper due to his affinity for slapping his victims. It's not so much his character that makes him interesting, but the situations they put him in. In his first appearance, educating Crash, Crash manages to take him down and take over the school, while in his second, Crash Jacked. He holds Crash hostage, hoping it'll make Bernstein agree to give him his bike, but ends up getting much more than he bargained for. Mrs. Lopez, played by Peggy Blow, is an apparently wealthy resident of the Bernstein's apartment building, who Crash regularly watches telenovelas with. Yes, it's a recurring joke that Crash watches telenovelas. She owns a lot of cats and a dog, apparently, as shown in comic book Crash. She appears just twice, first in season 1's Cold Hard Crash, and then in season 2's Frat Chance. Lastly, there's Dr. Gordon, played by Rizwan Manji, an Indian doctor with questionable qualifications who Crash is taken to for his unusual problems in both season 1's Scaredy Crash and season 2's Double Header. He's pretty funny. It's very possible that some characters would have popped up more had the show not ended so abruptly, but we'll never know. According to an interview with NY411, Eric Friedman conceived the show from reflecting on his own childhood, where much like Bernstein, he had a loving father, but his mother was much more present in the lives of he and his younger brothers, who therefore looked up to him as a more prominent, older male role model in their lives. Crash and Bernstein were meant to have a similar dynamic, Crash is effectively a newborn child, making Bernstein somewhat of a parental figure to him, allowing the two to learn from each other. This makes the show sound much more profound than it actually is, though. Include the two of them getting into some sort of conflict and them reconciling in the end with some sort of contrived lesson tacked on about friendship and brotherhood and responsibility. These lessons never stick. And these moments become less frequent as the series progresses, 
would have become more absorbed in its wacky shenanigans. The reason for making Crash a puppet is that Friedman wanted the character to experience a high amount of cartoonish violence, which a real person obviously couldn't go through. But he felt that traditional animation would both feel too far removed from reality and wouldn't mix well with the time and budgetary constraints of a traditional sitcom. Friedman had previously worked with puppets on Crank Yankers, and in Design and Crash decided to keep things simple and Muppet-like, a design that would be easy to morph into any shape or form while still keeping recognizable, and also was quick and easy to repair and built alternate puppets for depending on the situation. According to this article about the show's release, the puppet was designed and built by Chiodo Brothers Productions, the people behind killer clowns from outer space. I say all this to show that Crash being a puppet was much more than just a gimmick as it might appear at first glance. And the show utilizes his puppet status to execute a level of physical comedy and absurdist humor and plot that wouldn't be possible with an on-screen human actor. Or at least, not nearly as funny. I think we can all agree there's just something kind of funny about watching a puppet get beat up and tossed around. Now, with an overview of the show overall out of the way, I think it's time to dive into the show's two seasons. <laughs> There's also Princess Glitter, Jasmine's doll who appears in seven episodes in season one and makes a single cameo in season two. She wouldn't be considered a character by most people's standards, but Crash treats her as such, considering her his love interest, though he is shown to not be very devoted. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm not going to be talking about every single episode, as I feel that would get repetitive. I'm just going to be discussing the progression of both seasons by mentioning the episodes that I find most noteworthy. Immediately, I find the second episode to be a vast improvement over the first. The plot of Crash trying to cure Bernstein's fear of bugs sounds like nothing special, but as many unconventional attempts make for some good comedy, including the show's first full-fledged song number. Oh! Oh, I'm Mr. Inchworm, inching along, measuring this bed and singing my song. While you sleep, I crawl in your ear, and lay my eggs to calm your fear. Then my babies will hatch and eat your brain, and giggle while you writhe in pain. And they thankfully don't make a huge deal about Bernstein having fear to begin with as something that's horribly emasculating. Though let's just say, if you're afraid of creepy crawlies, this is definitely not the episode for you. And Crash ultimately has little to do with the resolution. In fact, his big fear throughout the episode ultimately goes uncured. Though that actually brings me to the best part, which is Crash's fear of mustaches. It's that special weird sauce that makes this episode feel truly unique from how any other show of this kind would present it. And the first example of the show taking a conventional plot and putting an unconventional spin on it. And it leads to perhaps the greatest nightmare sequence in anything ever. <laughs> While the pilot does a good job setting up the show's plot, this episode does a much better job introducing you to the show's uniquely absurd brand of humor. So if the first episode isn't doing it for you, I don't think there'd be much harm in skipping straight to episode 2. That being said, it only became apparent in this most recent rewatch that these first four episodes, at least, were aired out of order. As episode 4, Educate and Crash introduces Crash going to Bernstein's school and having the top bunk over Bernstein of things that were already shown in Scaredy Crash. Oh, I get it. It's a fun on the face Scaredy Cat. The reason for this is that Scaredy Crash was pushed back so it could be advertised as a Halloween episode. While the episode centers around fears, there's Halloween decorations in the background, and Bernstein's fear is shown to have been formed on a previous Halloween, there is no direct reference to Halloween in the present tense. But it was just tangentially related enough to where Disney XD felt confident airing it during a Halloween iteration of their regularly scheduled Monday night premiere block, Monday Mayhem, that night renamed to Monster-Sized Monday Mayhem, where it premiered alongside new episodes 
of several other Disney XD originals, most of which were also just regular episodes that had enough spooky theme in to be branded as such. This practice of pushing back or delaying episodes for themed nights of premieres back when cable channels were actually willing to put in the effort of doing themed nights of premieres. Episode 6, Home Alone, with Crash. Yeah, I meant it when I said the quality of these pun titles widely varies. It is definitely Crash at his most chaotic thus far, as it almost comes off like he's intentionally trying to sabotage Bernstein during this occasion of them being home alone without Mel's permission and with Mr. Poulos on their backs. And he also gets a small child stuck inside an air vent. Crash, what made you think it was a good idea to put Jasmine in the air conditioning vent? <laughs> actually, actually, that's a funny story. Uh, turns out, she's too big for the garbage chute! We also see that he's developed kleptomania in episode 8, Undercover Crash, which also just so happens to be Holmes' the greatest fight scene of all time. <laughs> The episode after that, System Crashed, is one of my personal favorites, and to me feels like the shift from episodes that mostly had rather conventional plots, just with a Crash and Bernstein twist or with the show's unique brand of humor, to more really clever and or strange stories that take full advantage of the show's premise, and you win seeing other shows of this kind. Episodes like Crash Crush or Crash vs. Flex. Even an episode like Release the Crash In, which has a cliche plot I usually hate in shows, makes up for it by having everything be ridiculously over the top. There's also Crash Asks Too Many Questions, where Bernstein introduces Crash to Cassie, this show's version of Siri, and Crash becomes obsessed constantly asking stupid question after stupid question. So much so that the voice of Cassie gets fired and so she comes to the Bernstein's apartment for revenge. I don't think the writers realized how smartphone assistants work, and it has perhaps the worst CG effect I've ever seen. But it's still made for a funny and entertaining episode, so who cares? Plus, it's a showcase of the show's habit of having throwaway jokes that actually pay off and become plot relevant in the end. Well, I'm off to archery camp. Like I'd ever take archery. 20 minutes later. There is one way to stop the belt. If one of you can hit that target with an arrow, you win $10,000. Amanda, this is perfect. No, I really don't she think She goes that. to archery camp. We're going to be fine. <laughs> Amanda Bernstein, you are so grounded. Notably, time is shown to march forward with Parade Crasher taking place during the last week of 7th grade, and the remaining episodes of the season presumably take place during the summer, with the second season picking up in the 8th grade. The season finale would air in September after a two-month hiatus, and is the show's one and only two-parter, Crash on the Run. And while it initially aired as one piece, I honestly think it works better as a two-parter as the second part for the most part feels rather disconnected from the first, despite featuring the same villain. That being said, it still delivers on a story that is much higher stakes and higher scale than anything the show had done up to that point, or would be able to do since, along with having some of my favorite gags in the whole show. Disney XD picked up Crash and Bernstein for a second season in April 2013, and production on the show would resume in July. The season premiere, The Nose Job Job, would air in October, just under a month after the season one finale, and on the same day as the Mighty Med series premiere. And it actually directly follows the season one finale by having Crash alternate between various noses throughout the episode. Crash's desire for a nose was introduced in Crash on the Run. On the same day the finale aired, Disney XD launched a page on their website where fans could vote for their favorite nose for Crash, cleverly titled Crash's Nose Picker. Haha, <laughs> get it? Voting lasted a week, and the fan favorite news would be revealed for Crash in the season premiere. 
which means this opening scene must have been filmed much later in production. And of all the noses the kids could have picked, this is definitely one of the more generic ones, but probably the one that aesthetically looks best on Crash. Ultimately, it didn't matter though, because Crash drops his nose in the sink and accidentally turns on the garbage disposal. And the whole plot point about Crash wanting a nose is little more than a running gag exclusive to this one episode. The actual main plot is Crash, Bernstein, and Pesto looking for a place to hang out as everywhere they go is infested with women. Dun dun dun. Ugh, what guy wants to come home to an apartment full of pretty high school girls? <laughs> they ultimately settle on this vacant lot outside an abandoned fireworks factory, but have to fight a band of role-playing nerds first to claim it. The iconic arcade, formerly the main hangout of the series, which appeared in over half the episodes in season one, and that Pesto's parents owned and he worked at, with so many iconic, no pun intended, and important moments taking place there, isn't even mentioned as an option, with the vacant lot effectively replacing it. Appearing in all but one episode of season two, while the arcade doesn't appear once. This episode is followed up by the show's official Halloween special, Halloween, where the Pollen Organization of Parents, or Poop for short, They didn't consult me before printing the folders! led by Gretchen, decides to effectively cancel Halloween for the kids at school, taking away all their fun and renaming it, well, Helpho-ween, which she plans on taking worldwide. So Bernstein, who turns out to be the chosen one, has to lead the Nightmare Society, consisting of Coach Urquhart, because his face is naturally creepy apparently, Amanda, who despite generally being a stick in the mud, as it turns out, actually really gets into the Halloween spirit, and two voiceless extras, they have to take back the holiday by giving Gretchen a good scare, which she just kind of gives up afterwards, with help from Crash, Pesto, and Cleo as well. It's a pretty decent Halloween special for the show, with the plot obviously targeting oversensitive parents who boycott everything. There's some Halloween pranks, and it's always nice to see the show's siblings actually work together, as rare as it is. On an unrelated note, this episode is actually really mean to Bernstein. Pesto indirectly calls him dumb at the start, which leads into a running joke of Crash calling him dumb. Do you really think I can get in? Why not? It's Nightmare Society, not the Honor Society. Ah! Pesto just called you dumb! And at another point, Pesto insults his appearance in a way that doesn't feel friendly at all. Sometimes I forget she's your sister, because, you know, you're dumpy and she's so... Hi, I want to kiss your sister and you make me want to throw up. In general, the second season is a lot more mean towards Bernstein, with more jokes at his expense, usually targeting his physical appearance, and it usually feels very cruel and out of nowhere. Here's the camera I used to photograph gorillas in the Congo, the Dalai Lama playing soccer, and you, when you were a minute old. I've seen that picture. You have not aged well. Though on the flip side, Crash actually handing out candy to trick-or-treaters is surprisingly wholesome. The only sadistic twist is that he is terrible when it comes to identifying costumes. Awesome dinosaur! <laughs> Woo, scary alien! Doctor? In general, I would say that Season 2 is a bit of a downgrade from Season 1. It's not super apparent at first, but especially by the second half, you start to see a lot less of those really clever and or strange plots from Season 1, and more plots that just kind of exist as an excuse to see Crash create chaos wherever he goes. Don't get me wrong, they're still consistently pretty funny and entertaining, there's just not as many plots or moments that stick out to me as super memorable like in season 1. Though it did make me appreciate the show's surprisingly tight continuity. You should tell them that knock knock joke that never ends! <gasps> knock knock! <laughs> Who's there? Knock knock! That's not how it works. Shh. Trust me. There's a big payoff at the end. Knock knock! Who's there? Knock knock! Who's there? Knock knock! Who's there? Knock! Knock who? Knock knock! <laughs> Bloody Butcher 2 the video game! Bloody Butcher 2, Chop House of Gore! He came to fix a faucet, 
but was distracted by Jasmine's Sparkle the Wonder Horse game. The magical world of Sparkles the Wonder Horse. On top of including the show's one and only true Halloween special, it also includes the show's one and only kind of Christmas special. You see, we find out in this episode, Merry Crash and Fest, we find out that the Bernstein family is Jewish and thus celebrates Hanukkah, not Christmas. Crash had apparently celebrated Hanukkah with them the year before and launched a menorah rocket and yet somehow completely blocked it out of his memory. Oh yeah! I totally don't remember any of that. Which I guess explains why in the episode where Carl returns, Crash acted as if they never met before, even though he is in this flashback. Though it doesn't explain why Carl and Bernstein both also acted like the two had never met before. When Crash hears about Christmas, though, and is told by Bernstein he can celebrate the holidays however he wants, Crash decides to invent his own holiday centered around himself called Crashenfest, which is now the only holiday that I celebrate, and has all sorts of weird and wacky traditions very much primarily inspired by Christmas. And this episode premiered after reruns of Christmas episodes from several other Disney XD shows during their Winter Wonder What? week. So yeah, I would definitely consider this more of a Christmas special than a Hanukkah special. Crash introduces Crash and Fest to the family and ends up ruining or improving their holiday, depending on how you look at it. And it ends with another awesome song. While Christmas is generally my preferred holiday, I do slightly prefer the Halloween special, as there's a bit more to it. While this one very much just feels like Crash and Bernstein, but during Christmas. Christmas. The Halloween special is better for people who aren't familiar with the show and just want to see a random Halloween episode, while the Christmas special is better for people who are familiar with the show and want to see a Christmas themed episode of Crash and Bernstein specifically. After this though, there would be a 7 month period between December 2013 and July 2014 without any new episodes, the longest hiatus by far. And unlike the others, the reason for this one isn't as apparent. Parent. Like during December 2012, it was probably in favor of holiday programming, and it makes sense that you'd want some space between your hour-long finale and the rest of the season. But here, the next one was just a regular episode, while the one after that was the one pushed back so it could air during another themed night of new episodes, Show Me the Shark, Escape from Bigfoot Island which aired alongside shark-themed episodes of several other Disney XD originals, featuring Captain Poulos and Bill Fagerbakke as Bigfoot. You know, the voice of Patrick. Fun fact, the caveman is played by Bill, uh, the voice of Patrick. Though more likely he was chosen here for his work on live action sitcoms like Coach and How I Met Your Mother. This is another episode that only on this rewatch I noticed how it was clearly aired out of order. With Bernstein trying to get pictures for his dad, who's said to be away despite the fact that he was just in the three episodes right before this. I think this is a bit of a problem with mostly episodic shows. The networks assume they can show them in any order they want when sometimes there are small plot threads. Obviously this episode was held off so it could air as part of this event, but my guess is that after the Christmas special, Disney XD decided it would keep the other remaining episodes on hold too so they could air them around the same time as this one. The series finale double header was clearly never meant to be one, though it is actually one of the better episodes of the season, even if I don't buy the subplot at all. Really, Amanda of all characters is having trouble insulting people, but the main plot is one of the better in the season, with it included more of the show's signature absurdity than most. With Crash popping a pimple resulting in a second head named Tucker Taylor emerging in its place, he proves to be much more popular and charming than Crash. So they have to defeat him by insulting him, causing him to shrink back into Crash's body. 
body. And I like the set piece of Crash and Bernstein's show on the school's TV network. While I highly doubt it was ever intended as such, it does do some good things as a finale anyway. All of the main characters are present, a formerly one-off character Dr. Gordon reappears, and Rob Saunders, who before was merely a puppet wrangler on the show, actually gets to play an on-screen role here, being the voice and puppeteer for Tucker. Though obviously the actual major recurring characters are absent, and the episode ends with Dr. Gordon telling Crash he doesn't have much long to live. Seriously. This could be the start of a long friendship. Or a short one. I got your test results too. <laughs> I'm laughing, but I can see by your face that you're completely serious. <laughs> But why did the show get cancelled? The fact that the second season has exactly half the episodes of season one makes me think that maybe at some point it had its episode order cut in half, but I can't confirm that. Nor can I confirm why it was cancelled to begin with. My one guess is that it just wasn't that popular. Despite the fact that Disney XD made him sort of their unofficial mascot for a little bit, I don't think the show ever really caught on like some of its contemporaries did. Which is probably partially because despite being designed to be as cool as possible to the channel's target audience, most of the channel's target audience would have instinctively written off a puppet as lame. And its general lack of popularity is reflected in its ratings. While there was never a huge drop off in viewership like with Mighty Med, which was similarly short-lived, it could still never keep up with their two flagship live-action shows, Lab Rats and Kickin' It. And when you consider all the alternate puppets that would have had to be made from episode to episode, it probably just wasn't considered worth the expense for the measly return. Though strangely enough, as the original show was airing its final episodes, Disney XD started production on a pilot for a spin-off of the show called Commando Crash where Crash would enroll in military school and would lead the delinquents against the favorited tryhards. Co-starring Cameron Oscasio, best known for playing fan-favorite character Dice on Sam and Cat. This obviously never came to fruition, but I love the idea, and that pilot needs to be released someday. And seeing that they were considering Greenlight in this, maybe the original show wasn't ended purely due to a lack of popularity. Maybe the creators also thought the original show's formula was getting stale and wanted a change of scenery for Crash. But for now, if we want more Crash and Bernstein, we just have to hold on to the slim hope that the show will be rebooted one day. It was surprisingly on Disney Plus day one, even before some much more beloved shows. So, fingers crossed? While I am generally positive towards this show, there are a couple episodes I'm not big on. My personal least favorite would be Motorcycle Crash, purely due to it being the most forgettable. The plot, as recapped earlier, is cliche as all get out. There's no significant Crash and Bernstein twist, nor are there any standout moments. Nor does it hold any character or plot significance, since even by the end of it, Crash is back to being just as big of a prick to Pesto as he was before. Second to that would be the penultimate episode of Season 1, Crash the Man. The first part with Pula's mentor in them in manhood is actually far better than the main plot of Crash and Bernstein going on Mr. Pulos and his friends' annual men's weekend camping trip. And it turns out that they're not as manly as they expected. This is the show at its most stereotyping besides the pilot and its two not so great results like before. Plus there's this terrible green screen bear and Crash using his mouth to cut people's toenails despite not having teeth. Though there is at least some irony to it, and it is nice that Bernstein saves Mr. Pulos' bacon, as he puts it, at the end. But really, those are the only two episodes I can think of that I significantly don't like. And even then, I don't think I'd call either of them bad. So the positives definitely outweigh the negatives with this show. And to prove it, I'll count down my favorite episodes. My top 10. No, let's go one step further. 11. 
actually make that 12. These are the 12 essential episodes. If you're gonna watch any of the 38 episodes, these are the 12 you should watch. There are good ones besides these, but these are the ones that best embody what I love about the show. The funniest, the smartest, the most creative, and the most memorable. Without further ado, let's dive into the top 12 best episodes of Crash and Bernstein. Number 12 monkey business. This episode starts off with Crash and Bernstein playing Tether Pickle just for fun, when Mr. Pulos comes in and tells them that playing for fun will get them nowhere. I played for fun once. It's a loser's game. He convinces them to participate in a series of quite ludicrous wagers. My name is Marty Pulos and I'm here to say I dislike you both in a violent way. In the last of them, Crash wins Mr. Pulos's treasured book, which his mother used to read to him every night before bed. Grease monkey. A motorcycle repair manual. A lot of motorcycles broke in my dreams. Crash almost immediately eats it, which turns him into a grease monkey. Or a professional motorcycle repairman who just so happens to look like a monkey. Okay, sure. It's this kind of out there storytelling where you just kind of have to roll with the show's logic that was largely missing from season two. And what they do with it lives up to that setup. And what they do with it lives up to that promisingly strange setup. When Crash gets caught repairing motorcycles, without a license, he gets a ticket from a cop, which he promptly destroys, only to get another ticket, and due to a misunderstanding, starts assaulting that police officer. And when he realizes he means money, he steals the cop's wallet. What is Crash's long-term plan to earn the money to pay the tickets? Repairing more motorcycles, of course. At first, Bernstein is understandably skeptical, but when he sees how much money Crash is making, he wants in. Though I do question their decision to advertise on TV, since Bernstein at least seems to be very aware of the potential legal repercussions, and who paid for the ad space. But who cares, it's really funny. Perhaps even more so when they bring it back at the end. And there are further complications when, when Crash poops out the motorcycle book and is no longer Grease Monkey. So Bernstein, with help from Mr. Pulos, has to fix the remaining motorcycles. And we get some more decent gags with Crash eating other books, including the aforementioned diary joke. Really, my only problem with this one is that like a lot of other season 2 episodes, it feels very incon- Consequential, as in it feels like the characters' actions don't have much consequences. In the end, they don't actually earn the money to pay Crash's tickets, but conveniently the cop needs his scooter repaired and says he'll exempt Crash from paying them if they can fix it. But then after Eden Pesto's comic book, Crash undoes the repairs on it and adds a self-destruct button, which because he doesn't heed Bernstein's warnings, the cop pushes it, destroying the scooter. But since the cop already ripped up Crash's tickets, everything is just honky dory and the episode just ends on another gag commercial even though obviously now the characters would be in even more trouble but i can ignore an underwhelming ending when the rest of the episode is this creative and funny it's one of the best of season two and the show overall it's just the ending that still could have used an extra repair Number 11, Crash's Maximus. Crash gets struck by lightning, which causes him to gain multiple personalities. Yeah, that's another one of those concepts you just have to roll with. I mentioned how Crash would take on a lot of alternate personas throughout the show, but this is definitely the one that features that aspect of his character most prominently and plays with it the most. You know, with him constantly switching personalities with each loud noise he hears. It's almost always funny whenever Crash dons an alternate identity, but what's more clever about it here is that each personality is actually foreshadowed earlier in the episode and suits the needs of each member of the family. The chef for Mrs. B, since she sucks at cooking. <laughs> Ever done to you. The caveman for Amanda, since it feeds her dating advice. I no like talk. Even texting. No text. No talk. Maybe grunt. Uh. Ah. Uh. Maybe. The Sovereign Millionaire for Cleo, since it feeds her financial advice. There's only one thing you need to know about making money. Find someone dumber than yourself and sell them something. And Cat Crash, who is somewhere between cute and completely cursed, is for Jasmine since she earlier in the episode lamented that she wanted a kitty. I want a cat! 
While Bernstein at first insists on giving Crash a chip that a build a bestie doctor said would fix him, yeah, in both this and Crash on the Run, build a bestie related facilities are shown to still exist, despite the fact that in the pilot, the local build a bestie was demolished by Crash and Bernstein themselves. But then Crash turns into a gladiator named Maximus Octavius, and it just so happens that Crash and Bernstein were supposed to be doing reports on the Roman Empire for history class. So he takes Crash to school as a gladiator to tell the class about the Roman Empire. But when Crash starts swapping personalities on them, Bernstein decides, yeah, I should probably fix him. It's clever, creative, and funny, but it's another one that ends with a bit of an anti-climax, with everything working out a little too perfectly for the main characters and no lessons really being learned. Crash starts swapping personalities, disrupting class, and destroying the other students' projects, and Bernstein Bernstein expresses regret for taking advantage of his friend's condition, but because the teacher mistakes it for an intentional allusion to a real-life betrayal in ancient Rome, which Bernstein rolls with, the two presumably don't have to actually face any punishment for their actions. And Bernstein is able to put the chip in anyway. So it didn't even matter. Bernstein didn't have to sacrifice anything. He was able to get a good grade and save his friend. He got everything he wanted. And this is season one. But I'll reiterate that a lack of ending doesn't ruin what otherwise is still one of my favorite episodes. Crash as Maximus is an episode that completely earns an A. Minus. Number 10. Release the Crashin. This is an example of an episode that takes a plot I would normally hate and actually makes it funny and entertaining. That being the whole plot of the annoying new neighbors who move in and won't leave the main characters alone. Completely oblivious to the fact that the main characters can't stand them. In these kind of plots, you usually just find yourself annoyed with the annoying characters. And also are just waiting for the moment the main characters finally man up and tell them how they feel. But the new characters here are annoying in such over-the-top ways, as well as the main characters' reactions to them, that it makes it actually really funny and not annoying to the audience. Plus, you have Crash repeatedly invading Mrs. B's middle school flashbacks, trying to make them more exciting. I guess we're to assume that she looked identical to Cleo when she was in middle school. And this also reveals another one of Crash's greatest powers, which is that he can invade and alter people's memories as he sees fit. Plus, it leads to another great musical number. <laughs> Homework, don't want to do it. Meatloaf, don't want to serve it. Taking an annoying and overdone plot and somehow making it hilarious, Release to Crashin' is an episode that is always a welcome sight on my TV. Number 9. Trash and Bernstein. Crash signs himself, Bernstein, and Pesto up for a cup stacking competition at school. Against Bernstein's will, mind you. Where they'll be competing against Cleo and two grown women who are supposed exchange students. They're exchange students from Czechoslovakia. <laughs> nice try. That's not a real country. Um, Bernstein? I'm pretty sure it is. And I got an H in geography. But as it turns out, Crash is insanely good at cup stacking, being able to learn and master it in a matter of seconds. But both Pesto and Crash end up getting distracted. Pesto because of him taking care of Amanda, who sprained her ankle, and Crash because he's started hoarding trash in the vacant lot and inhaling toxic fumes, which makes him hallucinate his trash heaps as alive and friendly towards him, leading to another other awesome musical number. This one might be my favorite in the series, which is probably a mix of it being one of the longer ones in the show, and it definitely having the most elaborate visuals out of any of them. Something I appreciate in both this one and the Christmas song is that despite being filled with jokes, they have the courtesy to shut up the laugh track and let you just enjoy the songs for what they are. I'm a junk man, nothing but a funk band, grooving with my junk band. This isn't weird. 
Bernstein tricks Pesto in the show not by texting him on Amanda's phone and convinces Crash that it's not the trash he's attached to, but the stacking. In the end, they just barely lose due to Cleo taking advantage of Bernstein's kindness. And Bernstein's theory was clearly incorrect as Crash never fully breaks free from his delusions and somehow ends up moving all of his trash to Bernstein and Cleo's room without anyone noticing until Cleo comes in. And because of a bet she and Bernstein made earlier in the episode, Bernstein is the one who has to clean it all up. See, in this ending, the character's actions actually have consequences which we get to see. Hilarious, creative, and totally bizarre as a good Crash and Bernstein episode should be, this is one that I definitely wouldn't call trash. Number 8. Crash Crush. Crash Crush is the first episode whose plot really takes full advantage of the fact that Crash is a puppet. Sure, we had seen Crash hit on lifeless dolls beforehand, but not a whole episode about him falling in love and dating a puppet who, unlike him, is just a lifeless puppet named Lola. At first, the puppeteer shrugs him off, but when he finds out that he can use it to his advantage, he has to keep up the illusion, so he can keep getting free extra hot hot wings from the arcade leading to plenty of good comedy. Crash begins ditching Bernstein in favor of the puppet, and through time, Bernstein realizes that he can't simply use reason on Crash. So instead, he decides to fight fire with fire by indulging in Crash's delusions until the puppeteer breaks, breaking the illusion, and putting everything back to normal. The puppeteer is shown to be a really sleazy guy, not just with him taking advantage of Crash, but also with him being creepy towards the waitress at the arcade. Uh, can I get your phone number? No. Oh. You're creepy. Uh, fine. I'll just track you down on the internet. So you don't feel bad at all to see Crash and Bernstein put this loser in his place. There's also a rather forgettable subplot, but most of these have those, so I'm not going to be taking them into account. Really, my one true complaint with this episode, which I'm not sure whether or not to even consider it a complaint, is that while you could say the whole plot is meta, there aren't really any on-the-nose meta jokes or winks to the camera acknowledging that, hey, Crash himself is a puppet, and I don't know whether or not I like that. On one hand, yeah, it'd be a really easy and predictable joke, but on the other hand, it does feel kind of odd that you have this plot and they don't take that built-in joke opportunity. But that doesn't really affect my enjoyment of the episode, as it's still a prime example of one of the things the show does best, which is giving you a plot that would only work in this show. And if that's what you're looking for, then prepare to fall in love with it. Number 7. Crash vs. Flex. A very similar plot to Crash Crush, with it hinging on the fact that Crash is a doll. Basically, while gathering stuff for the school's rummage sale, Bernstein reunites with his old favorite toy from before Crash came into his life, Flex Fletcher. After that, he starts hanging out with it all the time, making Crash green with envy, sometimes quite literally. Afraid Flex will replace him. Again, the joke being that their rivalry is completely one-sided since, unlike Crash, Flex is just a lifeless toy. Crash becomes so jealous that he actually sells Flex to a guy at the rummage sale who wants him to complete his collection of Flex paraphernalia, negotiating with him so he ends up buying him for a low price. And he also put rattlesnakes in Bernstein's bed, apparently. Really, you? Baby rattlesnakes? Babies? Bernstein is furious and Crash at first tries to replace Flex, but then they make up and decide to meet with the guy at the arcade to get Flex back. Only the guy, this grown man, loves Flex, this kid's toy, so much that he wishes to keep it from this 12 year old boy even after they try to appeal to his emotions. And with that, it would have been easy to make him a complete jerk, but they kind of make him sympathetic by showing that he's a pretty sweet dad. Oh, hey, Peaches. Hey, Pumpkin. Hey, Bumblebee. Oh, honey, your braid's coming out. I've got a bobby pin in my fanny pack. And in the end, it's kind of silly with them realizing, oh, he needs flax more than I need flax. I already have Crash. I live with four girls. He lives with 13. His wife, his six daughters, his mother-in-law, his great aunt, and her four female cats who only let him watch sports on his birthday. He needs this kid's toy as some sort of manly escape. 
And yeah, it's pretty corny, but still kind of wholesome, seeing the way they relate to each other. I don't know, I have mixed feelings. It was a good idea having it end with Bernstein moving on from Flex, but did the person he ends up giving it to have to be a grown man with a family? Also, how did Crash manage to drag all three of them all the way over to the arcade from the apartment? Hey Amanda, how's it going? Good, that'll be a dollar. <laughs> Every question's a dollar? Yes. Dollar. Are you serious? As serious as a new pair of boots. Good chat. Next. But everything leading up to that ending is so funny that I can forgive its weirdness. And more so appreciate that they attempted a really sweet moment, even if it doesn't completely pan out. And again, I like that this time they subvert the idea of having the antagonist being an irredeemable prick like the antagonists are in other episodes. So if you can tolerate that little bit of sap at the end like I do, I think you'll be in for a good time. Crash vs. Flex. Watching this episode is even better than playing with your favorite toy. Boy. Number 6. Action Zero. After seeing how much of a sore loser Crash is when it comes to pretty much anything, Bernstein lets Crash win at arm wrestling, which turns out to be a huge mistake as Crash gets a huge head after this. Big enough to where he challenges an action movie star named Jake Mahoney, played by Aaron Hendry, to a fight, who just so happens to be in town to film his next movie. This episode is the one that really made me realize another thing that makes this show unique, which is that it's pretty rare to see this level of jerk-ass protagonist in a kid's show like this. At least, with the show actually being self-aware of how much of a jerk-ass the main character is, and where much of the conflict is driven by them being a jerk-ass. And the comedy is supposed to come from laughing at how absurd that behavior is, and seeing how the other more normal characters react and how their jerkassery can often blow up in their face. In my opinion, this is the best example of Crash being a jerkass in the show because his jerkassery is only really to his own detriment. And once again, the person they pit him against, Jake Mahoney, from the very beginning is shown to be just as much if not a bigger asshole than he is. I mean, he actually does provoke Crash by carelessly stealing his locker and moving his stuff to the trash and shows how petty he is by the fact that he actually accepts Crash's challenge based on Crash posting a video of him role-playing with dolls to make fun of him. So you don't feel bad at all when Crash humiliates this guy in another climactic showdown. And while Crash is still the same jerk-ass in the end, he gets his comeuppance with Bernstein leaving his head behind. The most complaints I have with this one would be total nitpicks. Like how convenient it is that all the main characters have a reason to be at the film and at the same time. Or the fact that Amanda survives this fall with no significant injuries. But those kind of plot conveniences you just have to accept in a kid's sitcom like this. Showing Jerkass Crash at its very best with a memorable set piece and antagonist to boot, Action Zero is an episode I would score a 100. Number 5. Crash on the Run. The grand finale of season 1 and the show's first and only double length episode. And it does not disappoint. Delivering a story with higher stakes and a higher scale than anything the show had done up to that point or would do since. That plot being that Crash and Bernstein have to evade a rather pathetic threat in Mr. Green, played by John P. Farley, the youngest brother of Chris Farley. An employee of Build a Bestie bent on retrieving Crash and having him destroyed. After Bernstein refused to have Crash thrown in a wood chipper and replaced during a recall and build a bestie dolls due to their apparent combustibility. This guy has no concerns about the fact that unlike the other build a bestie dolls, Crash is alive. The threat is Crash getting murdered. That's pretty much as high as the stakes could possibly get, though in all honesty he could probably regenerate from it. And Crash and Bernstein's adventure takes him as far as Mr. Poulos's cabin, a location introduced and Crash the Man. So I guess that episode was useful for one thing, and it looks like there might even be some actual outdoor filming, which is super rare for sitcoms on this kind of budget. Plus, you still have some great gags with Crash inadvertently ratting himself out at every turn, Crash and Bernstein's stupid diversions that somehow always work, and again, musical numbers. I wasn't kidding when I said those tend to be highlights. You girls make me say what, what? 
got a picture of you on my butt, but oh, he was great. Crash was great. Oh, he was great. Crash was great. Oh, he was great. Crash was great. Everybody! Crash was great. Oh, he was great. Crash was great. Oh, he was great. Crash was great. I said earlier that I think it works better as a two-parter than a full TV movie, and I still stand by that. As while they share a villain, they do feel mostly disconnected. The first part is mostly Crash trying to evade the guy, you know, on the run, while the second part shows the climax slash resolution of the first part before becoming more about Crash trying to lay low. And rather than wanting to ensure Crash gets thrown in a wood chipper because it's his job, this time Mr. Green wants to let Crash suffer by gifting him to his uncaring mother who favors his brother. But as a simple two-parter, both parts are pretty much equal in my eyes. And it still exceeds what the show is usually able to do in a regular half hour, and becomes one of the best episodes of the series. Obviously, since it's on this list. And it's another rare episode where we get to see the family not at each other's throats, but all work together to reach a common goal. And this one, it's Save and Crash. Though come to think of it, they don't really defeat the villain in a proper way, so I guess after all that trouble, he just finally gave up. Intense, hilarious, and even a bit epic, Crash on the Run is an episode you won't want to run away from. Number 4 Monster Crash. While I can't find any promos for this one, it premiered alongside new monster truck themed episodes of Lab Rats and Kickin' It. So clearly this is another one that was part of some themed event. The plot is that Crash gets a trucker hat at a monster truck event and believes it to be his lucky hat. But when it goes missing, he suspects the whole Bernstein family. It's a basic whodunit story, but I usually like to see those in shows, as it usually means an excuse to see much of the main cast. Plus, Crash shows that he actually has some pretty good deductive reasoning skills. Somehow being able to perfectly deduce what each suspect would have been doing at the time of the hat's disappearance, complete with him impersonating each of them, which is really fun to watch, and narrows it down to Bernstein, who also uses his impeccable sleuthing to deduce that no one stole his hat. Crash's lucky hat was hiding under his rain hat the whole time. I guess they just all know each other that well. Bernstein impersonating Crash is also pretty fun albeit a bit more disturbing looking. Cole Jensen gets Crash's inflections down pretty well. There, Hattie! That'll keep you dry! Sorry, Rainy. I don't have a hat for you. What more is there to say? It's a fun whodunit story with the whole main cast and the novelty of seeing the cast members impersonate each other. Monster Crash is a monstrously good time. Number 3. System Crash. As I mentioned earlier, I consider this to be a bit of a turning point in the series, where the show started to prove itself to be something truly special. And yeah, it's still one of my all-time favorite episodes. The plot is that Crash, Bernstein, Amanda, her friend Jennifer, who only appears in this one episode, Cleo, Jasmine, and Mr. Poulos all happen to be inside the apartment during a windstorm that causes a communications tower to go down, leaving them unable to use their phones or the internet. And it just so happens that they were all using their phones and or the internet at that time. On the surface, it seems like it's just old men making fun of kids these days so dependent on their technology. Though, to be fair, Mr. Poulos is also shown to be rather dependent on his technology. It goes in a lot of the places you'd expect it to. Crash tries to appoint himself leader and choose who gets eaten. Poulos introduces them to an ancient technology known as books. Amanda and Jennifer have to learn to communicate with each other verbally since they have only ever texted and Jennifer's voice turns out to be rather annoying. It's been a catastrophic fail. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get over her voice. But when tensions rise, Poulos proposes an indoor game of football. And that's when the episode goes from good to really good, and earns a spot this high on the list. The climactic showdown between Crash, Bernstein, and Jennifer, and Cleo, Mr. Poulos, and Amanda. Some of the best gags from the entire show come from these last eight minutes. The kind of stuff that is just so, so very stupid that it's genuinely hilarious. Even if you don't like or aren't familiar with these characters, I'd be shocked if you didn't at least crack a smile at at least one joke in this episode. Plus, it's the origin of this image that appears at the end of most of my scripted videos, so you know it's high up there. And I'm only just now realizing that it's kind of a bottle episode since it's 
entirely confined to the Bernstein's apartment. And I think the fact that I was able to get this much enjoyment from just these seven characters in this one location is a testament to how good this show could be at its very best. It's unfortunate that they never declare a winner, but alas, those kids are just too attached to their technology. System Crash is proof that all you need is good writing, good humor, and a few good characters to have a great time. Number 2. Crashy Mix Smarty Pants. This episode answers a very big and very scary question. What would happen if Crash had influence when some of his backward advice just so happens to actually work, causing him to be mistaken for a genius, becoming a local celebrity, renaming himself Crashy Mix Smarty Pants, with the neighbors lining up at the newsstand to pay just to hear his completely nonsensical advice, which they now all blindly follow causing complete chaos. He even gets a book deal. Or as I would put it, Crash forms a personality cult around himself by complete accident. Seriously, everything Crash says, no matter how blatantly stupid, these people try to rationalize because they've convinced themselves he's a genius. Not only is it very funny to see these people act like total zealots, members of the church of Crash and McSmarty Pants, while Crash eggs them on with his awful advice because he too has convinced himself he's a genius, but intentionally or not, it does actually provide a really good lesson for kids. While presented in an exaggerated and cartoonish way, it is not that uncommon in real life to see people blindly put their faith in a charismatic public figure, going along with and agreeing with every little thing they say without thought. And if that person does say or do something they normally wouldn't like or agree with, they'll either flat out deny it, brush it off, or try to bend it so it does conform to their pre-existing beliefs. And if you dare criticize that person, then you just don't understand them. Obviously, this can happen for a number of reasons, which I won't get into here. No matter how illogical they might be, we as a species often like to have someone to follow. And what better and more extreme example to demonstrate this phenomenon to kids than Crash? A character who has already been shown time and time again to be a complete idiot and a horrible role model. Model, the exact opposite kind of person you'd want to take advice from. And in this episode in particular, is shown to give, quite literally, the opposite of good advice. Alright everyone, grab some scissors, we're going for a run! And because Crash is just given generic bad advice, not specific to any particular real existent person or group, not only does it make that so timeless because you can relate it to any real life instance of something similar happening, but it means that the people following Crash, Gretchen and Mel's boss Andy, don't come across as straw men, and Mel and Bernstein don't come across as mouthpieces for the writer's beliefs. But rather, it comes off as an example and warning to kids of how anyone can fall into this trap. My one complaint is that it feels like it resolves itself a little too easily. I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but let's just say, considering how devoted these people were to Crash throughout the episode, rationalizing every little thing he said, no matter how blatantly dumb, there's no way they wouldn't try to convince themselves that this was somehow actually some sort of deep metaphor. But I get it, it's a mostly episodic comedy show. You have to have everything reset by the end for the next one, and you do feel the consequences unlike previous episodes, with Bernstein getting his comeuppance for profiting off of these people's blind faith. Crash doesn't get punished since while he was egging them on, to be fair, they were the ones who convinced him he was a genius to begin with, but he does get taken down a peg, realizing once again that he is, in fact, a big dum-dum. An episode of Crash and Bernstein of all shows that gives kids an excellent allegory for a real life phenomenon, possibly by complete accident. And it premiered in a marathon of Crash and Bernstein episodes. What could be better than that? Well... And my favorite episode of Crash and Bernstein is... Comic Book Crash. So from all the previous entries, you'd probably expect my all-time favorite to have certain qualities that make it stand out from the rest. Is it the most creative? No. Is it the smartest? No. Is it the weirdest? Not even. Comic Book Crash is my favorite episode of Crash and Bernstein simply because out of all 38 episodes, 
it's the most fun. We find out that Bernstein has a hobby drawing a superhero comic book. The character is all based on people he knows in real life. The main character being his superhero persona, the Shredder, and the villains being the League of Annoyance, consistent of the Textress, based on Amanda, and the Sarcastinator, based on Cleo. And Pesto is also a character. Pesto's a character too. He was bitten by a radioactive possum. Now, whenever he senses danger, he curls up and plays dead. Of course, when Crash sees it, he wants in, which Bernstein obliges, riding him in as Mr. Purple. Despite the fact that Bernstein wants no one else to see it, Crash uses two sticks of dynamite to blow up the locked trunk in Bernstein's closet he was keeping it in so he can steal it, mass produce it, and distribute it throughout their school and neighborhood. Because it becomes so popular, Bernstein seems to warm up to it though. And it just so happens that Roland is hosting an underground film festival and thinks it would make a good movie. He gives them $80 to start with, which Crash promptly wastes on a giant sandwich, and Mr. Poulos appoints himself director because I was in the AV club in Plumbers College. <laughs> oh, I can't beat that. Which is just perfect. And all the show characters play their respective comic characters. So they're combining a superhero plot with a movie making plot. Both concepts that usually make for good comedy in shows. And the same is true here. While we only get glimpses, it is fun to see how all the show's characters are reinterpreted in Bernstein's comic book. And of course, since none of them have any prior film experience, they are not very good at acting and don't have the best ideas for what the movie should be. And the costumes and set pieces look convincingly cheap, with them literally just filming the movie in the arcade. Though of course, that's not even the main focus. The main focus is that Crash is upset that he's his sidekick, not just in the movie and comic book, but now people are starting to consider him to be Bernstein's sidekick in real life. So Crash ditches them to try and make his own movie where he's the hero and Mr. Poulos is his sidekick, the plunger, because Crash offered him 50 bucks. The only problem is that Bernstein is still using their only camera and through a mishap involving Mr. Poulos in a barrel with a rat, that one camera ends up being destroyed, ruining their chances of making the movie. But in the end, they become real super superheroes and stop a dog thief while in costume, with a little help from Pesto as the possum. <laughs> Which was actually another example of the show's use of foreshadowing, taking what seems like throwaway dialogue and then making it actually become important in the third act. There's a guy going around here stealing dolls! And in the end, Crash is still being considered Bernstein's sidekick and has to put this newscaster in his place, which was the perfect comedic way to end the greatest Crash and Bernstein episode of all time. So there you have it, the big 1,000 subscriber slash 50 video special, Why I Love Crash and Bernstein. My thorough analysis slash retrospective of this show, its plot, its world, its music, and its characters. My discussion of my favorite and least favorites and other noteworthy episodes. Hopefully through this you have found at least something to appreciate from the show. Something that would make you wish to revisit it with a new perspective. Even if you still dislike it, the point of this video wasn't really to convince people who dislike this show. It was to shine a light on what this show did right. And believe me, this show did plenty of things right. More right than wrong in my eyes. Whether it be its inventive and offbeat plots and sense of humor, its incredibly talented cast, especially for a show of its kind, or maybe you can just admire the amazing puppet work at display. There's a lot to like here. Did some things not age well? Of course, that's just the nature of TV shows. Does it have its problems? Of course, nothing is perfect. As I've indicated, I'd only actually consider about three-fifths of this already short show to be truly standout children's television. But for that brief time, it was something really special. And at the end of the day, I'll always love this stupid show. And as I've said, as fun as it can be to rip to shreds a bad piece of media, my favorite part will always be highlighting the underappreciated. And if I could give at least one person a new perspective on this underappreciated show, then that's all that really matters. As always, I am the Cartoon Koala. Thanks for watching, subscribing, liking, commenting, all of that. Thank you all for 1,000 subscribers, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Crash and burn. 
my grandma. Here's the <laughs> Crash and burn! Stay home! That's the moon at our house! Good call! Crash and burn! Take the bell off! Stay in hell!